Um, but anyway, I just wanted to kind of highlight for everybody some of the, um, um, you know, some of the problems that may appear. Uh, see, so there was one, one of the first ones with that piecewise. Chapter 12, number 2, the piecewise defined um, function on the right hand side. Can see anybody uh, figure that uniqueness part or no? No. Okay, so it didn't work out. Um, the, the, one of the things in, in this problem is that you can solve the system explicitly, at least on each portion of the of the phase uh, plane. Okay, thank you. And I took it off my, my screen. Okay. Um, so, let's see, so, I don't know, let me, let me ask, so any, any questions on, on any particular problem or was this one, yeah? fields would not be defined on the entire plane, then I would say yes. Um, but because they are defined on the entire plane, and right there, there is no singularity, there is no holes in the domain, then you can, um, you don't have to come up with that, let's say this is, this is an example. Okay, this is on the entire R2. Okay, so, yes, conservative means by definition uh, that f is the gradient of a, of a function, no, minus or just gradient, right? Which means uh, the first component is a partial of v with respect to x, and the second component is partial of v with respect to y. Okay, but to show that it's conservative, you don't ha I mean, what's the tool to, without having to come up with V explicitly? What's the test? It wasn't too hard, yeah, so. <laughs> but the test is that partial of F with respect to Y, I guess partial of G with respect to X. Then, can you conclude that f is conservative in this case? Why not? Oh, they're not equal, right? But I mean, if if uh, okay, if this were if this were true, you could conclude that f is conservative, right? So that's the test for uh, conservative vector fields, right? Again, if it happens, if it's an R two, okay. If it's not on a simple to the connected domain, then it's not. Uh, that's not. That's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Okay. So anyway, in this example, probably it's not. Those are not even equal, so it's not conservative, right? So this is in general or on simply connected regions. Okay. 
So, um, so anyway, I think the first and the third were, looks like they're conservative, right? But the second is not. So this one is not. Um, Does anybody that did number six on this same chapter thirteen? Yep. So this was slightly different than than the um, you know standard. Uh, force field that that appears from the two body problem, but right there you had x to the power third. The length of x to the power third here you have, you have x length of x to the power four. So this is actually a attractive force that's in the direction of x. So it's a central field, but the magnitude is inverse proportional to the To what? Cube power of the cube, the cube distance, right? Cube power of the distance. So this is uh, minus one over x cubed x over x. <clears throat> okay, so it means that uh, it's it, it is. If you're close, if these two things are close to each other, then the force is actually stronger than the gravitational force. Okay. Um, anyway, what do we know about about uh, uh, solutions of this system? You mean they were going? Well, that's that's the same phenomenon that happened when you had um, the standard one. I think depending on the initial conditions that you you pick, uh, you actually can um, go like a hyperbolic instead of elliptical. So hyperbolic means it's kind of tends to a line. You know, it has has that uh, linear behavior. Let's see, you said you. Did you get something in OD solve or? No, I just found it in the Uh huh. So clearly, this is also this is a conservative field, right? Why is this a conservative field? Hmm? Right. So it's a field. It's a central field. So it has. It has this um, direction in the in direction of the uh, the origin, and also the length is only depending on the distance away from the origin, right? So there's, there's that theorem which which uh, says that in in this case the central force field is is gradient, okay? So it, tur it turns out this is gradient of some. Um, I don't know, V of X. Okay. What what would this V of X be? So it's the same question as before, basically. Hmm? Well, it's uh, the f the force field is is gradient, right? And when you have a second order equation with a gradient right hand side, then you can make that Hamiltonian, right? So 
So then you can write the Hamiltonian to be one half this square plus the gradient plus v of x. for this four-dimensional system. All right. So as long as you have this, this potential function. So how do you compute the potential function? Well, first of all, why, how do we know it is a potential function? Well, if you look at that force, just like before, if I, if I write x1, x2, for instance, x and y, let's do x and y. Well, I don't know, that's what x1, x2. So this is what minus x1 over x1 plus x2, x2 over x1 plus x2, excuse me, squares. This is the distance, oh, and I have squared, everything squared. Right? So is this gradient? Is this conservative? Well, what's the problem here? This is not defined on the entire plane, right? So checking that condition that the partial of this with respect to x2 matches the partial of this with respect to x1 is necessary to happen, right? But it wouldn't be sufficient to conclude that it's conservative, right? So what's the way to, to figure out it is conservative vector field? You have to come up with a function. Right? So how do we... Can somebody... Uh, did you come up with a function? But it's one. It's one over um, one over this, right? That if you square, gives you, of course, um, there are some constants. So this is grad of v with a half or something, right? So it's just one over the magnitude of x squared. That's the potential, right? Hmm. There's a minus, yeah, thank you. So maybe, yeah. There's a minus, because when you differentiate, you come up with a minus. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, so basically this means that the Hamiltonian <clears throat> is uh, 1 over 1 half y1 squared plus y2 squared minus 1 half 1 over x1 squared plus x2 squared. Let's see, and this... This makes the system look like this, right? Partial um, x1 prime is y1, which is partial of h with respect to y1, y1 prime is or let's put x2 first, x2 is y2 so it's partial of a to the respect to y2 and two more right so you have y1 prime is It's x1 double prime, right? So that's minus x1 over x1 squared plus x2 squared squared. And that's minus partial, should be minus partial of h with respect to x1. And y2 sh prime should be minus partial of h with respect to x2. X, yeah. And I think that's, right? So it's a Hamiltonian system. And it always work, works like this. If you have a second order, <clears throat> second, equi second order system, 
where the right hand side is conservative, so it's a gradient field, then the whole system is, is, is a Hamiltonian, right? So there is this Hamiltonian, and in addition, what else? Uh, what is what else is is happening? Is is just the fact that you have a Hamiltonian enough for a four-dimensional system to to understand the solutions? Or not? If it's a two-dimensional system and, it's, and you know it's Hamiltonian, then what does it tell you? The solutions are on level curves, right? They're signature level curves. And that's one-dimensional thing, right? So you're on a, you're on a level curve, so you're, you're bound to, if you start on a level curve, to stay on that level curve, right? Now, the level curves may actually be periodic or they may be homoclinic, right? Or, you know, so two-dimensional two Hamiltonian Um, it, it could be, I don't know if you've seen this, probably you've seen this, it could be a heter homoclinic orbit, right? Then it could be, um, well, okay, in general it's, it's, it's a, there, these are closed curves, right? So level curves of H are one-dimensional. Okay, so then once you start there, you have to stay on on it. So you you know how the solutions look like. But if it's a if it's a four-dimensional system, then what are the level surfaces, or what is H equals constant? Hmm? They're three dimensional. Okay, so you don't have. You, you're basically looking at. If you want to understand a solution, it all it says that it stays on that hyper on that hypersurface. It's a three dimensional thing, right? So what else do we need? What else? Uh, what uh, what additional information do we need to kind of figure out this motion? Just like in the two body problem. And of course, I think it was presented in, in the, one of the presentations. This um, angular momentum, right? Has to be, well, it doesn't have to be, but when you have a central force field, Central force. It also says that it is <clears throat> so this is an R three basically, right? It's an R three but it's central force. It it says that the angular momentum is is constant, is preserved, right? Meaning that the derivative combination was done, uh, let's see was basically derivative with respect to T of the x with the, velo uh, the, the position with the velocity crossed with velocity in R3 is <coughs> the, the, cha the product rule, right? And this is zero because it's the same, you know, same vector, and this is zero because of central force, right? Because second derivative is in the direction of x, okay? So the cross product of 
again is zero. So this whole thing is zero means that x and x dot is constant, right? Well, it's constant it means, you know, if I start somewhere in the space, but where I, if this is my position and this is my velocity, then the whole motion is going to happen in, but at every subsequent times, I'm going to be in a plane, right? Whose normal is, is this, right? Is this uh, x times x, x cross x, x prime. Okay. So every, every, you know, every subsequent time, I'm going to be in this plane. So this is x prime, and this is x. Okay. I don't know how 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 obvious is this thing. Why is it not? Because I I have a sense. Okay, there are two two types of difficulties here. Um, you basically have to know a little bit of cal I mean a little bit of advanced calc three. Um, a curve in R three parameterized curve in R three right has basically. Um, has a position, has a uh, direction of the, 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 the velocity, right? The derivative, basically, the vector is velocity. And it has two other vectors, right? You can think of, of two other vectors, normal and binormal. Okay? Um, how do you, how do you de determine that a curve is actually planar? by this information that x cross with x prime is constant. It's a constant vector, not just constant direction. It's a constant vector. Even though I think even the direction would be enough. See, basically it says that this uh, cross product, it always comes uh, normal to this plane, and this plane is always stays the same because it has the same normal. Okay. It goes to the origin, so you have a plane that goes to the origin and contains and stays normal to this stays perpendicular normal to this one fixed vector, right? So it is one plane. And therefore any other point here is it will have to mean this plane, right? It cannot be out if it's outside of this plane then X would not be in in the plane again. Okay. So, preservation of angular momentum and Hamiltonian system combination of those two tells you what? Well, it's conservative because it's Hamiltonian. Has a has a conserved quantity. The Hamiltonian actually has two conserved quantities, right? Angular momentum and Hamiltonian. But how do we use this both to see the picture of our Basically, the picture of our uh, of our solutions. Hmm? Well, that's probably you know that's basically the question. Once you so once you fix the plane, now once you know in which plane you are, right? It means your curve has to stay in that plane. On top of that, it has to stay on the hypersurface of that. So h has to be constant on that, right? So it's, it's imagining taking uh, the place where h is constant intersect to this plane. Right? So the question is, so this, it means that the solutions x of t um, must remain on the intersection of this plane you know, basically spanned by x of zero and
right? The initial, the initial uh, position, initial velocity, with the level surfaces h equals constant. Okay. And what are the le what are the level curves? Well, what are the level when you set that thing equal to some some uh, constant? Okay. When you set that thing equal to some constant, basically you have to see: Do I get closed orbit? Do I do I get closed level surfaces, or do I get other things? So, uh, just imagine, for instance. Let's pick one, sir, one, one, one such plane. For, for instance, x1 is 0 and x2 is, and y2 is 0. No, x2 is 0, 1, 2 is 0. So let's say um, x2 is 0, y2 is 0. It means that h equals constant means 1 half y1 squared minus 1 half x1 squared equals constant, right? So you, you basically see what kind of well, what kind of curve is this? Is this a circle? One one is like a square root of it's not a circle, I think it's it doesn't look like it's a it's a closed Orbit. Uh, it's a closed solution, right? It, it looks like more of a um, well. You just have to plot this function and see what it is. But you see, it has a asymptote at x equals zero, for instance, right? So it looks like a hyperbolic. Well, it's not really hyperbolic, hyperbola, but so this thing is not bounded. It doesn't look like it's bounded. Right, so it's not it's not a closed curve. It's one of those situations where the level the level curve is actually it, does, it doesn't stay bounded, so it doesn't uh, come back to to a closed periodic orbit. Right? But it's probably just going um, to infinity. So that's what you see basically in the simulation problem. But again, depending on the plane, you may actually have uh, like I think in the plane. You see, this is what happens here, but if you take the plane, for instance, y1 equals 0 and y2 equals 0, then it means that, indeed, x1 plus x2 equals constant, right? So this means this is a um, circle, right? So depending on the initial conditions, depending on which plane you are, you may actually have circle as the solutions. Okay? But you have to be playing with those initial conditions. Right? Um, and I don't know how legitimate is this both derivative equal to zero. I guess I don't know how, how valid are the, those periodic solutions. I don't think that they actually may not be because this means it has zero velocity, right? So zero velocity means basically you're at an equilibrium point. Although, uh, no. Hmm? The first derivative of x. What x we we call uh, x one prime is y one, x two prime is y two. But basically, it means you would have an object at some distance with no velocity, right? And yeah, what's happening? Yeah, because of this force, uh, you would have. Although I'm a little bit concerned what happens when you get to this point. It's infinite. Uh, so you may not get a... So you, you may not have this complete circle, right? You may just go here and then the solution may stop to exist. 
you know, in finite time. That's probably what's happening. But anyway, these are very kind of uh, um, um, special special initial conditions. The other one, so this, okay, so this one that I picked here would mean would mean what? If I have x one, x two, I said x two is zero, so I'm I'm somewhere here, right? But y two is also zero, so it means that the x two prime is also Zero, so that's not good either, right? Because then it means it goes this way too. Okay, so probably these are kind of maybe you should put y one equal to zero. Okay, you should put y one equal to zero instead of y two. Then you can you can see you start here and you don't go in this direction, but you may go in this direction. Okay or y2 is not zero, then you get this um, infinite. Anyway, so that's kind of the... Um, it, it very much depends on the initial conditions, and when you simulate, that's, that's very critical. Let's see, so coming back to that problem in chapter 11, 12, excuse me, just want to say one word, and then um, number two on page two seventy three. Let's see, I'll, I'll write solutions for this, but I just, just want to, I mean, with every problem like this, you, you want to give a, you kind of want to make a road, road map as, you know, how am I going to get to uh, to whatever the conclusion needs to be. Uh, <clears throat> so, this one is a system, x prime equals y minus f of x y prime equals minus x, um, where f is actually piecewise. So there's one expression in each of these um, kind of bands, right? So I have one expression, uh, one x is less than negative one, Another expression when x is negative one, and, and the last one for x greater than one, right? So, anybody was able to plot the direction? I mean, the face portrait of this. Cut them up. That's that's it. And tape them, right? Felt like hands on, isn't that? If you do from negative one to one only, uh, it will be very. It will be look very, very uh, uh, um, simple, right? Because it's system is. I mean, you can you can really treat this by um, yeah. Well, that doesn't really matter because this this guy is continuous, right? So this this function is is piecewise defined, but it's continuous at the two endpoints, um, and I think you want that. So anyway, this is one one negative one zero. So when you do the face portrait, you you'll you'll see what spiraling out, spiraling out. Okay, so it's going to be uh, going. Out like this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Counterclockwise, you think? Okay. Clockwise. Okay. All right. So this goes 
out, but of course there are there are these two values, right? That beyond which the direction field looks different, right? So um, the goal is to show that, well, the first question was simple, right? Well, sketch, okay, to so cut and paste. Um, but then basically the, the question was, do you have a periodic solution? Okay, And just the fact that you do have a periodic solution comes from what? Well, probably comes from tracking one of these solutions, right? And of course, here it's going to change uh, the behavior, and here it's going to change the behavior. And if you have a periodic solution somewhere there, then the omega limit set of this cannot be, I mean, it has to be bounded, right? So knowing that you have to look for a periodic solution tells you what? Well, I'm going to consider the omega limit set of this, uh, of a solution starting close to the origin, right? And I'm going to show that it doesn't kind of, the solution cannot leave a certain huge region, right? So it has to be bounded. And being bounded, it has to be a periodic solution or an equilibrium, or contain an equilibrium. Well, this probably is the only equilibrium for the entire system, so it has to be a periodic solution. Right? Let's punk our appendix on again. Um, but the more difficult question is, how do you show there is a unique periodic orbit? There is no two periodic solutions. And I would say, be, uh, besides just, I mean, uh, short of going through the basically the same kind of arguments that the Van der Poel equation um, in, the, in, the, in that chapter, which basically shows, you know, how. Um, how come you cannot have two, two periodic solutions, one including the other? Uh, I would say that in this case, it's probably easiest to just solve this explicitly. Okay, So find the solution explicitly, um, and then do sort of matching at this point. Okay, So you're going to solve this. You're going to basically explicitly see what this uh, x and y is in this region. Okay? When it hits this x equals 1 or negative 1, you're going to switch to, you know, these other ones. Now, of course, I'm saying this, but I didn't do it myself. Um, so, let's see, unless somebody has tried it already. Right, so there's going to be a different, here's going to be different. Um, you can anticipate this, say when x is positive 1, uh, greater, than po greater than 1. I put a plus here. That's right? Huh? When you push through the negative. So is this right now? Yeah. Okay. And um, and this is still linear, right? It's still linear, but what's the equilibrium point? Well, x is zero, y is negative three, right? So the equilibrium point, if 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 it, if this was on the entire plane, would be somewhere. Did I say x equals zero? Yeah, x equals zero here, and y equals negative three. So so the solutions are actually approaching this thing, right? And of course. they would have to go in here with negative 3, but they can't, right? Because then it gets into this other uh, region. And by, by, I think by symmetry, you can, you can say that it's in this region is also the same, except it's positive 3. So solutions here go like this, OK? Anyway, the point is that you can actually make this um, fairly explicit. You can you can solve these things, okay? Explicitly for x and y, and um, it's just a matter of, of matching this, you know, the constants at the, at these boundaries. Okay? So again, you start you start for instance with a with a solution here, 
you follow it along along this um, trajectory, right? Then switch, then switch, then switch, and you basically can figure out a Poincaré map, right? And you will have a periodic solution when you're at the same point, right? For points inside, um, so that's the road map. I mean, uh, <coughs> right? So if you have the uh, the point is that you're going to have a solution that kind of follows a spiraling out, then tries to catch in, then spirals out, but then tries to to go in again, right? <coughs> and I should have used different colors, but. Um, and for points outside, so take take um, a value for I don't know. It could be on the x-axis, just to, for simplicity, right? If I start with something that's outside, and of course this is going to go out, right? Then it's going to switch. So you're going to have whatever four switches here. The question is, are you going to go in or out? And you can do this explicitly. That's the, it's tedious, but you can do it explicitly. And you will see that beyond a certain value, this thing is going to be um, above this point. Right? Yeah. Uh, the derivatives here. Um, that should be the case, yeah. Right, so this should, yeah, thank you. So this should be a little bit smooth, right? That's what, that's what your point? Yeah. So this should be actually smooth, because I said those are, that's right. So this should be smooth here. But actually, sh should, shouldn't be smooth for all, even if you're inside or outside? I think so. Because derivative is equal to f, yep. So anyway, basically you can you can uh, uh, follow this computation and, and see that there is only one uh, solution, well, only one, uh, for instance, value for y x equals zero that you return in the same place. This way you can actually compute that solution explicitly. It's one of the rare cases though where you can compute a periodic solution explicitly. Van der Poel, you cannot compute a periodic solution explicitly. So if you were to do that proof by picture, you could actually line those up to find out what the... Oh, yeah, yeah, is. yeah. When you cut and, kind of cut and paste, right. uh, you, will, you will see... You can find what it is. Of course, you should, you should have uh, enough curves to populate the plane, but you will actually see that uh, solution being periodic. Okay. And probably you will see that it's unique because you will see that outside of that periodic things are going in. But maybe I'm maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe maybe things are going out. I don't know. Um, certainly when they are inside, they're going away. They're going towards that, right? Because that we said that's the omega limit side. Does it have to be a circle? It will not be a circle because. Because uh, on these pieces, this is spir spiral, spirals out, right? And these, I don't know how what the shape of these curves are, because they're, um, I think, corresponding to repeated roots. Okay. So in a way, this is. Uh, I didn't. I didn't say this, but because it's, um, if you look at the, where is the system? Here's the system. If you look at the null clients of this, y equals f of x and x equals 0. So x equals 0 is the y-axis, right? So that's that's not nothing uh, fancy. But when you do y equals f of x as a null client, you will actually see this um, it's not a cubic, but it, it's like a caricature of a cubic function. Okay, so 
this could be a uh, think about this example as a caricature of the van der Poel. And things, you know, you need things like this because van der Poel, as easy as it is, it's very hard to, uh, I mean, to do anything explicit about it. Okay. So, um, so this would be maybe a way to understand it better, but it involves some computation. So, so nobody has done the computations. Anybody has done any any other way of showing uniqueness? My picture. Okay. All right. Have I sparked your interest in the pursuing this? No. <laughs> Explicitly, yeah. Around the periodic solution? Uh huh. Okay, so well, hold on. You have found a periodic solution. Yeah, that's a periodic solution. Some section, okay, neighborhood. You know, and how do you get uniqueness? Uniqueness is kind of a tough one, right? If it's, there's, it depends on the next word that being has True in that neighborhood, but uh, how do we know that 10 kilometers away there isn't a same pattern? You know, so you're right. In, the, in fact, now that you said, I think it's there's a um, there is a way to see that this orbit, well, assuming it's unique, is actually uh, stable. That things around it have to go towards it, right? So there's there's no way for another one to be nearby. Okay, but this is local property. Um, and that's using that Poincaré uh, formula. What was the Poincaré formula? Well, the Poincaré map, we said, remember what we said? We said P prime, if this is less than one, then we have orbitarily stable periodic solution and what was this? This was e to the in integral of of what? partial f with respect to x plus partial g with respect to y evaluated at the solution less than 1. So basically the integral had to be less than 0. Here, here f is the right hand side of the first equation g is the right hand side of the second equation uh, what's the um, right hand side of the second equation was negative x right so this doesn't depend on, on y so this is zero and this You see, there's a little bit of a problem because um, the right hand side of, well, I shouldn't call it little f. Um, so the right hand side was y minus f of x. So when you take with respect to x, it's basically minus, okay, that's a bad one too. Let's put tildes here. Okay. So partial of f tilde, this right hand side of, the, of that, uh, with respect to x, is minus our f that's piecewise, right? So it's minus partial of this with respect to x. And you saw that f function has positive and negative portions. So, so it's not 
uh, very easy to see that the integral of, of this should be negative, right? Would be negative if the integral of the positive part is pivot. So what you want is you want to show that the integral of f partially with respect to x along the solution is positive, right? But it's not because, the, the, I mean, it's not uh, obvious because the periodic solution goes in the regions where uh, f is increasing and f is decreasing. Okay. Okay, so, so that doesn't, I mean, that's in its own doesn't tell you that the, the periodic solution is actually uh, asymptotically stable. There's something that you have to do more, and what I what I what I uh, said is, you can do it explicitly. Okay, you can do it explicitly because on each piece of the face portrait, it's everything's explicit, right? Okay, let me um, unless there are other questions. Once more, when you if you if you haven't if you haven't gotten to proving uniqueness, which I, I take it you haven't, okay, don't claim you proved uniqueness. You see, I mean that's the whole thing is that when you when you try to show something and you, you just make up an argument, you know it doesn't hold water most of the time, right? Why? Because it's a difficult it's it's a difficult uh, um, question and it has to have a you know specific uh, argument, right? It's not just that any generic argument. That, that's the whole thing when you talk about nonlinear systems. Um, it's almost like every single problem needs a special argument. So don't try to borrow things that you think might work and 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 patch an argument that is not solid. You know, I mean that hopefully, hopefully you've seen enough of this in the. Um, Homework and the exams, but uh, let me let me hand in this and talk about it. So, just, I'll take it. Okay, so I put seven problems here. So, um, so the uh, exam is due um, next Monday by 5 p.m. in my office, and um, definitely I don't want. Well, by now you know that there's absolutely no work um, that you can share with others. Uh, you can ask me if you have questions beyond today. You know, you, you can email me or you can um, see me. I'm going to have some extra office hours. Wednesday from 12 to 4. Um, this will be sort of shared with my introduction to OD class, which... Uh, I guess the first problem could be on both exams. It's, it's, it is it is basically a, a, a introductory uh, OD course type problem. But anyway, um, feel free to stop by then if you if you need to. And um, yeah, you can email me. And, um, I. <laughs> I am going to make one um, comment about the very last problem. Okay, um, I may send a revision, so I just make sure that you check your email today. Um, I may send a revision just in case uh, there is a typo or something. Okay, um, so maybe don't start with the last problem. Okay.
But if I don't send anything today, then it's, that's, that's going to be fine. And actually, the final version I'm going to post on the website. Okay? So whatever is going to be on the website, that's the final one. Um, okay, so let's uh, go over this just a little bit. Um, let's see, I started to bold some of the words, but then I, I think I didn't do this for the other ones. Anyway, the point is, I'm asking something. You please uh, address that that um, um, that question. So, for instance, the first problem I say, find the general solution explicitly. Okay, so basically, you nothing fancy. You just solve that linear first order constant coefficient non-homogeneous equation. Okay. All right. And what's the basically? Your favorite method? Uh, I think there is only one method called. How do we call? How do you solve this? Integrating factor. Okay. <laughs> okay. First, that's the first method you learn in the in the other course, right? Okay. So, so you got to do it with the integrating factor. Uh, once you have it explicitly, you should basically know how to answer B. And for C, just plot the face portrait. Um, there's a D field, right? Did I post that or? I think I should because we must have talked about this initially. Yeah, D-field, okay. Okay. And then I wanted to actually um, explain why, you know, what does it mean for that solution to be asymptotically stable and then prove this. So you have to make a proof, okay, of that. Uh, whatever you see on the picture. Okay. Um, and I have an extra credit uh, question here, which, again, it's an extra credit, so you don't have to do it, but... Um, it's very similar to the previous one, right? But it's, I don't think it's as easy as this one. Okay, number two. Um, ah, this is a typo. That should just be X prime. I don't know where is the quotation marks. So X prime equals AX, right? Just a standard linear system. Uh, it's two by two. What can be, what can be better? Um, just make it canonical form, uh, find general solutions, plot the face portrait, blah, 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 right? And then also show or check whether, um, well, you have to show this is a Lyapunov function for the canonical form of the system. And lastly, you have to find basically the, the Lyapunov function for the original system. So that's probably one of the easier ones. Uh, number three. It's a it's a, again two by two system, nonlinear, two parameters, right? And just restrict in the in the first quadrant, so you don't have to do anything in the other quadrants. Um, but figure out basically the face portrait, null clients, um, any bifurcations. And I say I want to sketch the regions in the AB plane, and I really mean it. Okay, I, every time I gave a, an assignment where I said do a, a, a bifurcation diagram. And most of the time, I didn't get a bifurcation diagram. So, bifurcation diagram means what in this case? Basically, in that plane of the parameters A, B, right? You have to come up with the regions or boundary of the regions where something happens, and next door, like something else happens, right? So you have to. That's that's what I mean. So. So even if it's blank, I want a, an X cross A cross B. Okay, that that you thought about that. Um, 
And number four, even though it's a three-dimensional system, you can still find the equilibria and determine the stability. Okay. Anything beyond that, um, it's optional, but um, could be extremely hard, right? Anything beyond that uh, stability of the of the equilibria. I mean, you can use ODE solve just for your own. Um, curiosity. Let's see, number five. I gave two system, two equations here, second order equations. I'm just uh, asking you to show that all of this, all the solutions are periodic. And I'm just Wondering what would happen if I would give this exam to the first uh, course, <laughs> to the to the 340 students. Well, for 340 students, it would be x double prime plus x, right? But you can deal with nonlinearity, so. Um, okay, and I want to prove. I don't want picture. Okay. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the, I'll bold the point, the words that I, um, that I care about in this, on the final version, ought to be posted on the website. Uh, number six, number six is also something um, where I want explicit computation. So. Um, Even though it's a nonlinear system, right, because of the y cubed, um, you can solve this explicitly, okay? And that's what I'm asking. Solve this explicitly, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll give you already kind of a start. How do you solve this explicitly? In general, a nonlinear system, differential nonlinear system, have we seen an explicit solution? Not really, right? So how come I'm, how come I'm asking this on the final exam? Well, if, this, if the, if the nonlinear system were decoupled, right, and you can solve that explicitly. Okay, I mean, I'll give you an example. Something like this, right? It's not, it's nonlinear, right? But it's decoupled. So what does it mean to solve it explicitly? Well, it says you know whatever it is. So it's um, well. I don't know, it was e to the minus t over 1 plus x not e to t, I remember. So basically you solve the logistic equation and you get this solution, right? Uh, let's see, is this right? At time zero, that's not right. Okay, where, where is that? <clears throat> okay, one minus x naught. Okay. Uh, 
all right and you solve you solve the other equation explicitly so I don't know you get what y of t is 3 plus Is that right? How do you solve this this thing? Well, again, integrating factor, right? E to the minus e to the e to the t integrating factor. Do I need do I need to show this? The method of integrating factor. You need it for problem number one. So you better say yes. No, I mean, come on. I mean, it's um, even even easier than this. But what's the method of integrating factor? Um, you write it in standard form, right? So y prime plus y equals three. You multiply by. Well, I'll let you figure out how to find the uh, form of the integrating factor. But in this case, is e to the t. So that e to the t times y differentiated is three to the t. And now you integrate, right? So it's 3 to a t plus a constant. So it's y is 3 plus c e to the minus t, right? How do you find the constant? Well, it's based on the initial condition, okay? And I think it turns out to be this, because when, when t is 0, 3 plus y minus 3 is y not. So that's So I think it's it's helpful to even in this uh, problem in the exam to well I stay I stay this next that you have an initial condition x at zero at time zero is x naught and y at zero is y naught okay so in fact that's the um, other thing is to compute compute the flow so what will be the flow of this dynamical system then flow meaning is basically the solution given at initial condition. So the flow remember what is the flow? It's basically a map that takes um, an initial point x naught and assigns the value that the solution of that system has at, at time t. Okay? So that's x of t and y of t. Oops, excuse me, little x and t. So that's what it is, right? So what is it? Okay. It's clearly nonlinear, but that's what it means to compute the flow. Okay? So that's the same thing there. Now, uh, if you go to your p plane, oops, time's almost up. If you go to the p, I won't do this, but if you go to p plane and type in this system, right? And look at the picture. I mean, Okay, you have what? How many equilibria? You have an equilibria at y equals 3, and x is either 0 or 1, right? So you have two equilibria, and you look at the face portrait, and I bet you cannot really tell that this system is decoupled from the picture. Okay? So that's why, that's the, the thing is that you cannot. Uh, the, the fact that it's decoupled allows you to, to solve each equation separately, right? But then that information is kind of, you have to match it with what you see in the picture, okay? Now this system is not decoupled, but what can you do with it? Solve for y first, and then plug it in the first equation and solve for x, okay? All right. Um, and the last point is I'm asking based on this information to 
and the fact that zero, the origin is a saddle. Okay. Remember how is this, a saddle has two directions. One is where things are going in, and one where things are going away. Okay. One is called a stable curve, the other is unstable curve. Okay. So basically, based on this, well, similar information like you get from your uh, computation, is to figure out for what values of x0 and y0, that thing goes to 0, 0. Okay? Well, in this case, probably none, no value. But I'm not sure, okay? That's the question. So just um, figure out for what values of little x0 and little y0 uh, as t goes to positive infinity, you have zero zero, and so you just have to look at the explicit formula for the for the map for the for the flow map. Okay, and again the last problem, I think it's okay. I think I think I don't have to make any revisions, but it's basically again one parameter of family of, of nonlinear um, systems. You can easily find the equilibria and the stability. Okay. Um, in part B, I want to. I wanted to. Well, I basically wanted to do a bifurcation diagram in part one. So discuss, discuss the equilibrium. The stability means that, right? Um, and then in part B, to show that for a certain range of parameters, there is what's called a heteroclinic orbit. Okay, what's a heteroclinic orbit? Goes from one. Equilibrium to another equilibrium, right? It hops like from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it kind of, right? It's um, in the limit. At negative infinity has one equilibrium, and the limit at positive infinity has another equilibrium. Okay. So part A is certainly uh, straightforward. I'm just gonna um, double check part B and post it on the web. Okay. Huh?